Welcome to the Great Bass Tennis Podcast. I'm Steve Smith along with Brandon Flanagan. Episode 69, coming from Boynton Beach, the FM Tennis Performance Center. Tonight, more truth in tennis. We're going to go through the different types of tennis pros. I'm an amateur writer. I wrote this many, many years ago. Um, I think a few of you will have I've seen this before. Different categories. These apply to only men. Not women. We're not picking on the not picking on the ladies. You know, it is a male dominated profession. See, it's uh, we we do have a couple great female coaches on our staff, but it's uh, there are more men coaching tennis than women. Would you agree? Yeah, no, we can talk about that and why. I mean, <clears throat> actually, in Russia, for the longest time, I mean, everywhere, women have been treated unfairly. Tennis wasn't an Olympic sport, so the inferior jobs went to women. And to this day, more coaches in Russia are female than male. Mm. Spent a lot of time, it, it really in Moscow only, but been there many, many times. And um, my mother used to say that it's too bad that there's not more men teaching in elementary school. Mm -hmm. So that just to have a balance. Um, yeah, I think about my career. I I worked for, for Mary Lay. She was uh, head coach of the Vic Braden Tennis College. I think it's 10, 15%. Mm -hmm. you, know, I know, you know, when you're teaching young kids and kids have to go on a bathroom break, the early childhood development, um, you know, sometimes for sure you need to have a female coach. But let's get going on this. Uh, my father used to say the world would be a very boring place if everyone were the same. My mother used to say it's wrong to put people in categories. Well... We're going to go through... Uh, <laughs> that being said, we're going to put people in categories. That being said, we're going to do that. I'm sorry, Mom. <laughs> but uh, why don't you go with number one, podcast number 69. Well, I'll say this first. I've been coaching tennis for just about 20 years in some capacity, and you've been coaching tennis for about, what, 90 or 95? You know, actually, Andy Fitzell, is, <laughs> he's great for tennis, um, and Andy's in his 40s, and... I was a volunteer coach when he was born. I mean, so I, I've been doing it a long time. <laughs> like, if I keep going two more years, I'll have 50 years. So 48 years teaching tennis. But I, I really feel that my, you know, like almost 15 years in ice hockey, um, that's more how I'm wired from the very beginning. Definitely helpful. But no, this list you've put out, you know, a few times on social media. I remember reading this years ago. And quietly thinking to myself, you know, which one of these 15 pros I might be, but of course, aspiring to be the total package pro. I think it's great for, uh, you know, tennis coaches, tennis pros to read this. And it's, it's also great for tennis parents to read this too, um, tennis players. Yeah, I think the course. tennis consumer, but also to its two-sided is that pros have to survive. And many times they're not wrong to fit this bill right. because that's what the customer wants. Completely, completely. Yeah, a good friend of mine, uh, Julian Krinsky, Ran an amazing business for years in Philadelphia. And uh, the people would always tease is that with with Julian, the customer's always right. With me, the customer's always wrong. <laughs> because I'm dealing with goal-oriented juniors. And one time I was at a conference speaking. And um, so Dennis, was, or excuse me, Julian was speaking. So I walked in and he's very smooth. And he said he just pretty much changed the direction of his uh, lecture and and said that he provides an experience and I provide an education. Mm. Um, so it's you know you know some kid wants a fun experience. It's actually the tennis teaching business is a service. It can be a disservice because mm. you know, the kid just wants to come out and hit and giggle, have some sure. fun, and you know you're saying okay, we're gonna do push ups for an hour. <laughs> it just doesn't fit. Doesn't work. So number one is the conference pro which I, I think that obviously with COVID and the conferences, I think you see a lot of this now too on uh, the Instagram pro, buy my course for nine ninety nine. But they, they live to be presenters and are typically good for about 90 minutes. They often pretend to have great programs back home, but they really don't. Year after year, their content remains the same, but is simply recycled with a different title. They specialize in selling their expertise to an out-of-town audience. I think obviously presenting is a much different skill than, than teaching. Well, people, yeah, I have to take your hat off to someone who can hold the attention for 90 minutes and get in front of a group with the PowerPoint presentation. 
for me, um, I know so many people, they just would thrive on having the opportunity to be a conference pro. There's other people like, yeah, I don't really need to do that. For me, um, I was flattered one time where Vic Braden said at a conference that I was not attending, that I had been to more conferences than anyone, but I was definitely a conference junkie. And I think if you can leave a conference and you've just learned one thing, I one time was listening to Warren Pretorius. A lot of years have gone by and I'd lost a lot of hair and didn't recognize me. I had to introduce myself. And we had met many years before that. And Warren, who's an intellectual, so runs tennis analytics, said to me, he goes, because I asked, I said, you spent a lot of time with Vic? And he said, no, a couple of your trainees. Uh, Dave Nostrand, um, Mark Jakes, and Andy Fitzell was part of that group too. He's much younger at that time. And what Warren said to me, he goes, you're smart. You got everything Vic, you know, in the very beginning where he goes, it took me time. I got a little nugget here and a little nugget there. Mm -hmm. But I do think that's a positive about conferences. But I do think that certainly Rocky won pretenders and contenders. There's a lot of people I know they're presenting and they do, they're very pretentious that they, they have a conference, at, uh, they have a program at home and they really don't. And they're, this is what their players do. And right. uh, they've really, they don't. I mean, and there's many people on YouTube now, uh, if you do your homework, they, they haven't really been in the trenches. They really haven't trained. Yeah, they haven't produced or developed. Uh, they haven't spent years teaching tennis. Yeah. Uh, a couple of young guys, uh, I know Ryan Reedy, he's, you know, he spent, he, does, he runs uh, two-minute tennis, does an outstanding job. But he, he spent 20 years working for Jim Klein, who's a former student of ours. But mm -hmm. I, I have some students who... I just, I mean, I confronted them and said, really? I mean, I think that you should pound a few nails before you become an architect. Sure. Well, it's like playing tennis. It's repetition. You know, the more hours you spend on the court teaching someone, the better you're going to get at it. Yeah. I remember I had a teacher uh, in prep school taught Latin and he used to actually practice. Mm. Um, you know, he was aspiring to uh, be hired at Dartmouth. He eventually was. and But he used to we used to just look through the window and he's, he, he's in there giving a lecture to nobody. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was long before people were filming. So conference pros, that's one type. Let's go to the next one. The briefcase pro. They seldom step on court. They count their money. Their staff meetings are never, are never about forehands and always about finances. They save a lot of money on sunscreen. They choke on their type of overhead. They farm out the work and never worry about the crop of players, just the profit. No, I think you have to really have respect for the briefcase pro. Uh, I think people should uh, know someone like Doug Cash. I mean, he can walk into a tennis facility and he's forgot more than I know. I mean, as far as the wind cost of windscreens and the lights and how's this thing working and, you know, just the uh, formula for financial success. So I don't want to downplay that, but I do think that you know, from our corner of the world where we're ball hopper pros is get a little chip on our shoulder because a lot of times a briefcase pro, it's pure capitalism. They're going to farm out the work. They, they get younger people that are very inexperienced. They're not trained and they're just carrying the briefcase. They're just counting the money. So um, it's, that's a pro that you've, if you've had years of tennis teaching experiences, still uh, stay connected with the game. That's one thing that, uh, um, you know, Tennis Corporation, Cor Tennis Corporation of America, the, you know, you think about a vertical move is people want to, well, I want to move up. And then people would move up, say, well, gee, I want to be a tennis director. You know, I think of perhaps Club Corp, uh, Lifetime Tennis, when you, sometimes people are just forced to be a briefcase pro because that's what the job's. Right. The job will even, even the job description, they're not even allowed to teach more than 10 hours a week. Yeah. So there's, there's a couple of different sides to all this, but go sure. ahead. Number three. Sure. We see this a lot in South Florida. The kill you with kindness pro. They dress well. They patiently and politely wait as the ladies talk at the net post. They are always politically and diplomatically correct. They repeatedly say nice shot and good idea. Their warm ups have no stains. They know now all social agendas. It's always baffled me at indoor courts where the courts are so expensive. 
get in trouble with the ladies. We will pick on the macho male egos, but the ladies will just stand at the net post. And there's all this, you know, valuable court time just t- mm-hmm. ticking away, ticking away. But I think you find that now uh, in junior tennis too many times where um, I don't know the key to success, but I know the key to failure and make everybody happy. Well, they're going to fail as a tennis player, but if uh, many, many times what will happen at a tennis club is you got to make it fun, fun, fun. So the kid wants to come back. Mm -hmm. And then you, I think you grow away from being a teacher with principles and then you can um, find yourself being a little bit too jolly. Yeah. I think it's important to be kind, obviously, but I, I, I think it's, it's, you definitely have to try to continue to help people get better. And if you're just telling them how good they are all the time, then. That's, that's yeah, not going to happen. A junior tennis player, Monday through Friday, they go to tennis and they love it. They're doing fun drills. This is great, great, great. And then they're not, not happy on the weekend. You know, that's what it is. Uh, we try to do it the other way where uh, not so happy Monday through Friday. And eventually they go to the tournaments that they can flat out play. Number four. The back slapping pro. They are great for men's night. Their motto, low to high and swallow through. Works for them and their followers. They hang around with guys after ball banging sessions to do 12 ounce curls. Good old boys love them. They're very comfortable with profanity. This past weekend, I was down in Boca at a junior tournament. And, you know, at one time there was 10, exactly 10 people teaching tennis. So I was there two days. Um, many times what will happen with a back slap and pro is they're just, they're hitting a lot of balls. That's what men's night that's what they want to do and um but it's a great workout you know i've run a lot of those workouts i mean i remember you years and years ago we used to call it want to work out less talk more sweat yeah um even run those where you had to qualify based on your fitness level Mm -hmm. not your tennis level Mm -hmm. this is for the the crazy fit um but with that people would walk out that was a great lesson and i'd say no no that was a great workout you you, (laughs) you just set them straight i said Please yeah. come back next time. But it was a great workout. It wasn't a great lesson because you didn't learn anything. Right. You might have learned that, okay, you got to get fitter. You got to uh, eat a little bit better, exercise a little bit more. Number five. Oh, one of my least favorite on the list. Again, we see this a lot in South Florida. The car trunk pro. And I think buyer especially beware in this situation. They sneak on public courts. They charge less than professionals. They hunt for discount hunters. They obtain their phantom credentials at Walmart. They also cut out the government from their work, paying no taxes. Well, first of all, I apologize to Walmart. I, <laughs> as I did say, I'm an amateur writer. Um, yeah, the Car Trunk Pro, you're going to find that in a place like Palm Beach County because the weather is nice 12 months a year. With Welby Van Horn used to say this, that a $5 lesson is generally much more expensive than a $50 lesson. Mm-hmm. Take a lesson from a proven professional. It doesn't take long to just look across the courts and you, know, you just know that, gee, the kid's not getting quality instruction. So just because it's cheaper, it's not better. But at the, on the other side of that, um, Nick Baltieri needs to give, be given credit for this. At one point, Tennis teachers were not paid what they're paid now. Nick Baltieri was the first one to come along and just charge so much money per hour. Mm. At one time in America, there's only one type of blue jeans. It was just Wrangler. You could just get Wrangler blue jeans. And then Levi's came along. Next thing you know, there was designer blue jeans. And it used to be a lesson was a lesson. And the, uh, the local pro would charge reasonable fees. They had to make a living. Mm. My father... Uh, we always belonged to a, a place where you could play golf. Mm-hmm. And I know my father would, you know, buy equipment um, from the golf pro. And I remember someone saying, you know, you can buy those. It'd be much cheaper if you bought them somewhere else. He said, if everybody did that, we wouldn't have a golf pro. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, support your local pro. But I also think too, is that um, we at a public tennis court, if you end up there where you're, having kids, you teach the kids, they're warming up for a tournament. Um, you just need to be conscious that it's a public tennis court. It's open for the public. It's not, it's, it's not there for you, for squatters rights to, mm-hmm. to use that court. Mm-hmm. 
um, with, uh, you know, someone that you helped out that I helped out, Raleigh Grossbaum. Uh, he was with me for a short time studying tennis. Um, and we used some courts that we've, we were told were, we joined the YMCA. I said, oh, no, you joined the, the YMCA courts, but they weren't YMCA of course. They were really abandoned courts. But what we could do is any, anytime anybody would show up, you know, we can just go teach on a field. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, you know, some of the, the teaching pros were shocked. They said, oh, no, no problem. You can have the courts. And uh, we would just go over and teach on the grass and they would be shocked that I could have these advanced players shadow swinging in slow motion. Mm -hmm. and, um, but you should be able to play, you should be able to practice on a field. You should be able to practice in a parking lot. But yeah, the car trunk pro, the, uh, it's, it's not right for them to be taking away uh, court time that's, it's a taxpayer's court. It's a public's court. Right. They're, and they're charging less because there's, you know, they're not paying for that court time. They're not paying well, a percentage yeah. back to the club. They're not paying for the courts. Also, a lot of times, too, they're not paying the government. Yeah. The um, cash money. Let's go to number six different types of teaching pros. The Merchant of Flesh Pro. They hang, hang out at local tournaments and pass out their business cards to parents whose kids can already play. They promise to skyrocket the kids to the top with their incredible self-proclaimed insights. They start all sentences with I or me. Yeah, that's not my favorite. I mean, I don't think it's ethical to approach a kid. We call it the third base coach as well. You know, you're coaching the kids about to score. We in America, maybe around the world, but in this country, we certainly need more first base coaches. Um, pride yourself on being able to take a beginner and create new players, not go and basically steal players. Mm -hmm. It's uh, the merchant of flesh pro. Um, I think you need to pride yourself. I understand college coaches are recruiters, but I think you need to pride yourself on being a developmental coach. The, you know, and then to have this, well, um, you know, this secret sauce, there is no secret sauce. There is no secret sauce. Now the consumer makes a mistake. I mean, say for example, someone's a really good tennis player. They go to college, maybe, um, you know, they weren't even good enough to, you know, make their lineup. Um, but they come back and they're not honest about that. And, you know, the older they get, the better they were. And the parents many times think it's a shortcut instead of just staying loyal and paying your, mm -hmm. the, paying the teacher who's working with your child is you're going to hit with a glorified sparring partner. Mm -hmm. Now, what we say in boxing, the glorified sparring partner, they wear a headset and they wear a mouth guard. They don't say anything. But the glorified sparring partner in tennis, they're compelled to say something. And that's, that's where their career starts. Their mm -hmm. career starts. And I, I understand there's a positive to this uh, paid hit with a UTR. I heard that and I said, I thought that was for the mob, paid hit. <laughs> but I was told uh, the young guy... Um, Eubanks from uh, Georgia, great tennis player. So I'm playing on TV. That means you're a great tennis player if you're playing on TV. I was told to hit with him for a UTR paid hit, $400, $450. And, you know, WC Fields, the sucker was born every minute. You're, you just, you're not going to get better by just banging the ball with, you know, somebody who can, you know, you know and that's how that's set up. Mm -hmm. So that, in the positive of that is a UTR I read where, it's so difficult for a young player to break in on the tour and make money. Mm. So that, well, they can make money to support their tennis. Um, but really in the end, um, I, I just don't see the positives in that. The merchant of flesh pro. Yeah. <laughs> number seven. What do you got? Major suck ups. They are sophisticated groupies. They kiss so much ass that human chocolate tastes like vanilla. They would change their last names for tournament credentials that assures them a place in the player's lounge. They are big time name droppers. You know, we're, we're actually uh, not using profanity on the <laughs> website, but uh, that's my fault. I, I actually wrote this. I apologize, Andy, Andy Fitzell. Um, I do think that uh, there is an art to profanity and sometimes it really helps. I have kids, I say, right, raise your hand if you've seen a PG-13 movie. It's just a donkey, right? That's the word that I used. Yeah, yeah. I'm like Ron Burgundy. I just read what's on the teleprompter. All right, right. Burgundy. <laughs> With, uh, what was the name of that movie? Anchorman. 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 I had a young guy 
Gareth Ducre. I was coaching Gareth, and he saw the movie on a Friday, and he just begged we all had to go see it on Saturday. And I remember a group of us went, you would even know these players off. Megan Broderick, sure. Jeffrey Secchi. Mm-hmm. And the three of us that sat there, and I, I didn't get it. You didn't get it? I, I didn't get it. I guess. San to, Diego. I have to see it a few more times. <laughs> but yeah, major, sick, major suck ups um, with um, sophisticated groupies. I always tease people and say, you would change your last name to hang around a really good player. You know, a lot of times, Braden used to say this, is that the player is not the one that changes. You know, a player starts to have some success in juniors. Mm -hmm. The player doesn't change, but everybody around the player changes. Mm -hmm. And you you can just see it, see it so loud and clear. Brandon Flanagan, number eight. The legend in their own mind pro. I know a few of these. The older they get, the better they were. Typically, they have played a total of four ATP matches and act like they won all four Grand Slams. Their egos are just like those of television tennis commentators. They put themselves in their own hall of shame, but don't know it. They act as if a lesson with them is a total honor. Well, I apologize to TV commentators. I'm sorry. (laughs) (laughs) With, uh, you know, it's good to have a healthy ego. Um, And certainly you can learn from someone who's played. You wouldn't want to take a lesson from an airplane or you say you wouldn't want to take a lesson on a flight airplane if the person had never flown an airplane. Right. Um, but, you know, you just think about like a Bill Belichick with the New England Patriots. Hey, Bill, let's see you punt the ball. How far can you punt the ball? Bill, can you throw the ball? Um, the, it, as well be Van Horn used to say, if you can play, and they, what, a, what a great player. He, he may be the best person in tennis who was an accomplished player and an accomplished mm. teacher. Mm-hmm. He took them both to the highest yeah. level, a true teacher. But Welby used to say it's definitely a bonus if, you can, if you've played the game. Braden used to say that if you expect yourself to play, excuse me, if you expect your students to play, you should expect yourself to play. Um, but, yeah, a legend in their own mind. We just talked to uh, Doug, Doug Verdick and, and his father, Again, really just social, recreational tennis player in many, many respects. You know, as a football player, was a three-sport athlete at Stanford and tennis not being one of them. And uh, obviously one of the greatest coaches of, uh, of all time. Yeah. Um, let's go with number nine. A lot of these in Boca Raton as well. Soap opera pro. These guys are R-rated. They're smooth talkers and have massive macho male egos. They don't break serve, but are known to break up marriages. It is a given that they wear a gold chain around their rubber neck. Their sunglasses hide their eye candy evaluations. For sure, they have a really nice car. These shaky characters go missing at lunchtime. Now, we do have some people listening that English is not their first language. We do have some people listening that maybe have not... uh, been in the locker room. They spent more time in the library than the locker room. And we'd have to actually explain when they wear sunglasses that hides their eye candy evaluation. That means they're wearing their sunglasses and they can look at women while they're looking at their sunglasses, where they're wearing their sunglasses. <laughs> yeah, we had a meeting earlier today and I have a young player here from Japan. I go, did you get that? Let me spell that out. So certainly uh, his English is much better than my Japanese. Yeah. But the soap opera pro, um, yes, I spent like many years in Boca, seven years in Boca. The, uh, I like that where they um, shaky characters and go missing at lunchtime. It's getting past PG-13. Yes, it is. It is. Okay, yes. let's go to number 10 from Flanagan. The Trench Pro. This is, uh, we're going into the more positive uh, varieties of tennis pros here. The Trench Pro. Well, according to our liking. (laughs) (laughs) It's true. We got to give these guys credit, though, the trench pros. Um, Hours after hours, feeding balls, hitting balls. It's not easy. They're true ball hopper guys. They love the game and seldom leave the court. They talk to kids and parents the same way. They have no hidden agendas and are a dying breed. They do not fit into the new American tennis culture and have nothing to do with glorified babysitting. Trench pro. Um, yeah, I think that you should talk to parents and kids the same way. Uh, that expression, you know, you can't fool a kid. You know, you know 
I think it is really important when kids have a comparative experience, you know, they, and they, you know, so maybe it's a analysis, a video breakdown and, and they fire, or is it, um, come back to Warren Pretorius, uh, you chart a match and it's a statistical breakdown. Um, the one thing that we do, the way we teach tennis or the way we can teach tennis at putting all these different, uh, methods together, um, you don't necessarily have to feed balls and hit balls. And so as you get older, um, you know, you start having the kids feed balls and, you know, and all kids should learn to feed a tennis ball. You know, we have kids visit and the first time they come, say they're a right-hander. You say, okay, let's see, feed some balls. Mm. And they don't put the basket on their left hip. Yeah. They put the basket on the right side and they have to every time reach over the basket, grab one ball or two balls and they reach over. And I just go, stop, come here. I said, you've never fed balls before. That's a problem. That means they don't do basket training. Mm-hmm. The, um, but the trench pro, um, that's where players are developed in the trenches. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, and it's not to belittle the guy with a shovel, but it's not easy to use a shovel. Not that I'm an expert with a shovel. Although to go back in time, I did work at a cemetery. My grandfather, Mikhail, used to say, you have such an important job. People are, people are dying to get in. <laughs> he also said that I have so many people working underneath me. <laughs> but, this is getting very dark now. Yes. But going, the, taking a dark turn. But the trench pro, um, the... Um, yeah, the working the shovel. I think of a David Ferrer. He's going to quit tennis. You know, he's stuck at like two fifty in the world. His father, his grandfather, said you can't quit until you do this. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and he had not pursued his education to a to an elite level. He was going to be a tennis pro, and that's what a lot of Europeans do compared to Americans. Americans will say, "I'm going to remain an amateur so I can play in college and then turn pro." Mm-hmm. So he was kind of putting all his eggs in one basket. So the story goes is they got him a job with a shovel and a wheelbarrow. That's a real trench pro. And I guess it was supposed to be two weeks and he lasted 10 days and he came back. And from that point forth, he was like the hardest worker Mm. in in, in tennis and very popular among the pros. His nickname, uh, I think it's, uh, it was Dog. That was your Spanish. Mm -hmm. Pero? Pero. All right, let's go to number 11 from Brandon Flanagan. The myth throwing pro. Their facts are fiction. They are pretenders, not contenders. They baffle with BS. Mumbo jumbo. They are tennis tech monsters. They love to listen to themselves talk about something they don't understand. Not too many balls are hit in their lesson. It interferes with their ongoing dissertation. The myth, Vic Braden, he was a myth buster. And I mean, people need to go back and I was always flattered that Vic used to say that Steve, you and I should be working together and we should have had a master plan. And I said, yeah, this is how it would work, Vic. You would have gone forward with a flashlight making new discoveries and I would have gone backwards hitting people overhead with a club. <laughs> Did you get that? They use my name in third person, Steve Smith. Uh, I've had a few people say Steve Smith is no myth. But the mumbo jumbo, I mean, the more people talk, the less they say. I can mm. come back to them and pick on TV commentators. If you listen to them, and actually with TV commentators, they definitely have a lot to share. But if you get online and you say, and I think Tracy Austin is one of the best mm. at, she's going to discuss how to hit a forehand or backhand. Mm-hmm. But when you, you take a lot of those top commentators, they were top players. And then when you listen to them talk about the serve for 30 minutes, the more they say, the less they know. Um, I love to listen to McEnroe, but you know, the Mac, you know, that's, you know, he, he's, you know, so great for tennis in so many ways, but you know, that's not what he did. Same, you know, Patrick was in charge of the USTA, he wasn't director player, though, he was a general manager. Right. But up to that point in his career, he'd basically um, you know, not given a lesson or been in the trenches. Mm-hmm. I mean, he had, I think, been in the quarters, US Open, the semis of Australia. But yeah, miss, boy, oh boy, they're out there. You know, you just, um, you know, we have a lot of online content or courses down together, up together, toss high for more time, scratch your back, stay down, come over the ball, come under the ball. That just goes on and on. Um, 
when I was tested by Dennis Vandermeer, and every time I made a mistake, it was more about the organization less than he'd blow the whistle. Mm. But, you know, just like the USDA, USDA does have, a, um, I think it's a group of four, maybe it's larger now, but people that travel around the country and they evaluate, uh, they police, maybe that's the wrong word, but they evaluate umpires, like who's going to make it to the U.S. Open? Mm, mm-hmm. How competent are they? But we really should have that. Imagine if we had the grip police or we had, you know, I was watching someone take an overhead lesson this past weekend. Is I do that when I get to a tennis so I'm going to go around, I'm just going to watch the tennis mm-hmm. teaching. But every time someone, you know, shares a myth that someone's right there to blow a whistle, the whistle would be, imagine that at a tennis club. I mean, there's 10 be, people, 10 people teaching stop. tennis. Yeah. <laughs> we have a new type of bird tweeting from the sideline. <laughs> Number 12. The cheerleading pump you up pro. We saw the King Richard movie. I think we recognize one of the main characters from that is very similar to this, this type of pro. They are masters of the one liners. They even use poetry, grip and rip, load and explode. They instantly hand out nicknames. They make 12 year old juniors feel like they should skip college tennis and go straight to the pros. They are popular pied pipers and inexperienced tennis players. Love them. Inexperienced tennis parents. Parents. Yeah. With, uh, yeah, you're referring to Rick Macy. Pop and the popcorn. With, um, you know, Nick Baltieri is someone who, you know, you got to get people to believe. I heard Carling Bassett say that Nick Baltieri is the, the best junior coach in the world and the worst pro coach in the world. Because uh, with the juniors, Nick was saying, this is what you're doing, my way or the highway. But then with the pros, they were paying him. Mm. But with Macy... Um, I remember working with Vicky Duval. In fact, at one point, it was set up that Carlo, Carlo Lavosi, yeah, he's done really well in business, coach in Canada that we've worked with. He's, you know, so he left tennis teaching. But really sight unseen, Carlo and uh, some of his friends were going to s- sponsor Vicky. She had the it thing. So I worked with her uh, brother, she wanted to come and work on her serve. She wanted to play the U.S. Open. And I said, you just need to play the 18th, get the wild card. So she did. So Nadine, um, you know, they went through so much with what happened in Haiti. Um, it's like a scene from a movie where um, her father, who was a practicing physician, he was, after that, he could no longer practice medicine. Mm. So she was at a tournament and um, some people that, had the financial means to get on an airplane and just have, you know, rescue the father from get her, get a medical attention that wasn't available. So mm. the airplane's there, but they have to go back and they have to, they have to go through the debris and look for his passport. So he could actually get out of the country. But I was having lunch with Nadine, the mom and, and Vicky and Vicky had said that she um, had worked with Rick. And I said, give me a second. I'll give you the nickname. You know, she's from Haiti. So I just said, yeah, he called you the Haitian sensation. She said, how'd you know? Well, Haitian, you know, but you actually, you actually need that. So, yeah. So Vicky, um, you agreed to, to be her coach and, but you wanted to give the people you're working with two weeks notice, mm. but she got a wild card. And, um, you know, so at one point with Vicky, uh, she started playing world team tennis. And I mean, I didn't know she was going to function that. Elton John was performing at, and with, um, I just think back that she, if she had just stayed with, you know, then certainly if she had cancer for a year, survived that. But yeah, so Rick, I mean, there's a positive to that, but uh, at one point um, with Macy and Matt, he, you know, we're talking about that movie, he wanted to work where I was working. I was a director of Seguzo Bassett, which is now Chris Everett. And Rick handled it so well. It's in his book. You got to flip it. You got to turn it around. Mm. And I really respect Macy for this. So um, he wanted to meet. So we finally meet and I had him watch this video and put it in. It's a kid who couldn't hit the ball very well. And I put another video in. Didn't tell him it was the same kid and the kid could hit the ball well. Mm. And then I asked him, I said, what do you think of this kid named Seth Rose? And he said, I've never heard of him. So for me seeing the movie, it was, okay, Rick was in a lot of financial, had financial pressure um, at that time, it was, it was at the time exactly. Mm. So I met with Rick and, um, you know, I mean, he turned as red as an apple. 
I said, well, the kid on the tape was in your program for a long time. Mm. Mother and grandmother supporting him. He went on and was all American and he played it. I mean, I spent quite a few, uh, quite a bit of time. Quite a few, um, maybe it was a three year period where he was mm. really young. And, um, you know, he's just one of these kids who shot up. And next thing you know, he went from a little kid to a big kid. And he was really he was a great tennis player. Mm. But Macy said it so well and he was so right. He said, Steve, you know, I'll work great together. You get the kids to third base and I'll bring them home. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the way we teach tennis, I mean, sometimes it's like the Jesuits say, if you could just have the first seven years and then let them go. Because perhaps, uh, you know, we're on the, de definitely not perhaps, we're on the side of overteaching. Mm. I'd say most are on the side of underteaching. But, um, you know, so, so not to be critical, you, on a, say, a small staff, um, you wouldn't want to have all trench pros. Mm -hmm. It would be, it'd be great if you had that pump you up pro. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a lot of the trench pros, you know, has, it comes down to brain type. And we had a whole entire podcast on that is uh, some J's, you know, they're only going to smile once a year. Right. Where, where P's are going to smile every minute. So, um, but yeah, let's go to the next one. We're at number 13, different type pros. And you can be a combination. It's not like you're one or the other. And sometimes again, your situation forces you to, um, like for myself, I don't really consider myself the pump to be that pump you up pro, but I mean, sometimes you got to do that. Like, okay, let me pump this kid up. He's down and out. The pity party, he's feeling sorry for himself. Lucky number 13 is the support pros. Difficult to find because most millennials are not looking to be mentored. So true. If you're lucky enough to find one, they know they've had, they have to pay their dues to progress from being an apprentice to being a professional. They patiently and loyally show up, put up, and eventually climb up. Yeah, no, we could put other names to this too. Is that um, this is there's more than fifteen? I mean, you need to go back and rework this a little bit. I could add to it. You know, I could sit around. And go, okay, let me come up with a new one. The YouTube Pro. Oh, brutal. There's so many YouTube Pros that they're just watching YouTube. But there's <laughs> some, there, there's there's the then there's the YouTube Guru. You know, so but the support pro. I guess the term millennial, uh, those that follow our Facebook content, we have over 5,000 pages. There's a song, just plug it in, a millennial song. Better watch it, Steve. I'm a, I'm a millennial, you know, so just watch what you say here. Well, you were born in 84? 85. Yeah, so, uh, but now there's the XYZ generation. I haven't kept up with that. So I, I just, it's just millennials. But uh, how many new generations are there, do you know? I'm not sure. Not sure, but, uh, but yeah, you're... Uh, you're not the youngest now as a millennial. There's there's new generations, but no, definitely a support pro. Uh, I tell a lot of people what you should do is get a job as a bartender, waiter, work nights. Uh, you know, you can work for anyone if you work for free. With um, like for myself, um, I was working for All American Sports, and I had a pretty good situation where summers in New England, winters in Boca. And, you know, all Americans first used to have a, pro have a program at Boca West. So Andy Brandy, I've mentioned to Andy before, he was telling me that Welby Van Horn's the best. And I, I think Vic Brady's the best. So I went to work for Welby for peanuts. You know, it was just a summer season. I, by circumstance, I could spend a lot more time with Welby than just that summer season. But so um, then I went, so he says, what are you going to do? You resign from your position. At that time, he was telling me, telling people that I was the smartest with six kids because I was out of the, the Northeast. I mm -hmm. wasn't dealing with old man winter anymore. So I said, well, I'm going to work for this guy, Welby Van Horn, for eight weeks, and I'm going to be paid this. Maybe, I'm sure he didn't. I didn't say I was paid. He asked me what he was going to be paid. And then I'm going to go work for Vic Braden. And he go, what are you going to be paid for work for Vic Braden? I said, I work for free. I'm going to just hang out. So that's where I had to, you know, I got a job working nights. But support pros, you need to be mentored and you, you need to hang around um, with, you know, Dallas. Uh, Dallas is a city unto itself. And I spent a lot of time going back and forth to Dave Anderson's place. Um, he doesn't actually own it. <laughs> with uh, Brookhaven Country Club. And there's so many pros that just didn't spend enough time working for Anderson. and But they would go around the corner where they can make a little bit more money. Mm -hmm. now, eventually you have to be able to move up. But I think that, um, you know, John Verde, love John Verde, used to um, manufacture the Stroke Master ball machine. 
John would say, you know, you, an assistant pro is a head pro in waiting. Mm. And, but you have to pay your dues. And, but no, it, it's just too easy for people. And I do think that when uh, tennis coaches first enter the industry, they're overpaid. They're well, they're way overpaid. Absolutely. They make too much money per hour. And a lot of them get stuck in the mud because they, they just stay right there and they don't do more things. Um, but no, I think that we need more support pros. Let's go to number 14. The political career climbing pro. They forget their roots and the people who've helped them along the way. They embellish their playing background and go to the limit to be around tennis celebrities and VIPs. They vanish from the locker room and become a permanent fixture in the boardroom. Nothing is funny if they are not in on the money. Agencies. Um, you know, again, picking on TV commentators. TV commentators spend a lot of time around professional players. And TV commentators end up getting a lot of jobs. Sometimes they'll leave their TV gig because they go back on the tour. Mm -hmm. But they're only really romancing the players that are making lots of money. Mm. You know, they're not only coaching the third base players, they're coaching the people who've already scored. Yeah. And, you know, where um, Darren Kale, you know, one thing about Darren is that he spent a lot of time with uh, a late, a young Leighton Hewitt. You know, you know, he was taught by the Australian Peter Smith and we have the American Peter Smith. I'd love to just look into the backstory. Hewitt was not the best ball striker, but you know, what a great, great competitor. You can see he's just, his DNA is Australian football. But that's that's one thing about um, Cahill is he stayed with him until he became number one in the world. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's amazing where, uh, that was one thing that was great about Dennis Vandermeer is he, he, he coached Margaret Corr, he coached Billie Jean King. I, you know, you say I had the dubious pleasure of teaching the best players in the world and the worst players in the world. <laughs> um, with, it's interesting that going right back to number one, the conference pro, it's amazing how people at a section level, they want to present at a national level. And people at a national level want to present at an international level. At one point, the ITF, they would only let two people from a country into a conference. I can remember being in Boca, and I actually introduced Jack Rappel to Tim Gullickson, and they became fast friends. And Tim was on the cover of Jack's first book, and the uh, I used to used to come back to Boca during the semester break when I was at this college in Texas, and we were with Tim Gullickson. Hey, Gully, let's do this. Let's practice in the morning. In the afternoon, we'll go to this conference, and. You know, we were not, on, you know, at that time, really not many people knew who Jack Grapple was and they certainly mm. didn't know who I was. Mm. And I said, no, we'll, we'll get straight in. Jack and I would not have been in. We'd walk right through the front door, but we were with Tim Gullickson and we were, we were in the conference. Mm. And it's like, okay, you want to go back tomorrow? Yeah, we'll go back tomorrow. So that's a, that's a very good example of uh, who you're with. Um yeah, people, I would say that a lot of people, they do anything they can to be in the booth. They want they want to be on the TV screen. And mm -hmm. once again, they'll change their last name to be in the booth. All right, winding it down here. Um, the um, Keep in mind that tennis pros have to wear several hats. So they can go, for, as I said, one, one category to the next. But let's go to 15. The total package pro. Most of them are deceased. They once played well. They can teach, coach, and manage. They can build championship cultures and make chicken salad out of chicken. Uh -huh. <laughs> In their world, the program is bigger than the individual, and everybody practices with everybody. They naturally teach character. Yeah, the difference between the total package pro, and also I think with that now, I mean, it's really progressed in a positive way where um, – you know, the four areas of tennis, you've got the, the technical, the tactical, the physical, and the mental emotional. I mean, I, for years, I've been able to get people in shape, but not that I know that much about the physical side of it. It's like, okay, I got a whistle and I'm going to, I got the voice and I'm going to make you uh, do these exercises and perhaps they're the wrong exercise. But the trench pro, many times they don't, you know, it's not, 
maybe not their thing or they don't have that particular skill set to build the culture. Mm. You know, they're just, it's just them. They're on one court and they're zeroed in on that one student. Maybe they're just giving private lessons only and they're not going to be the one who, uh, you know, creates that program. You know, let's be on the program and then, you know, everybody in the program. For me, what should happen in a junior development program is there is no stratification. There's no caste system. I mean, I think it's wrong, wrong, wrong when the advanced players don't know the names of the beginning players. Mm. Everybody should know everybody's name. And granted, the compatibility factors, the players, you know, the, the beginning player to the advanced player, they can't do drills with each other. They can't play matches with each other. Oh, certain enough, they could do some technical drills with each other, just tossing balls. But they can all start with checkpoint. You know, we will we'll do solo exercises where, say, for example, at a typically a, a tennis program, the coach or the coaches, they have to talk to a couple of the parents that are dropping off their children. And the program shouldn't wait. The program should start. You know it's a really good program if the coach can or coaches can disappear for a few mm-hmm. minutes mm-hmm. and the program runs itself. But with, yeah, so sometimes the, the trench pro, they're not capable of that, but the total package pro, they're, they're going to make that happen. Um, I think going back to the, the YouTube coach, there's so much plagiarizing. You know, Andy Fitzell did a great job over two years. The pandemic had a lot to do with that, but he put together these quality Instagram posts. And now with social media, which I know little about, I try to know as little as possible. Like, for example, I've put something on Facebook for, we've only missed like two days, and that was just recently, for uh, well over a 10-year period. Mm. So no, I don't post. It's not a principle, no. And I, and I don't really, you know, you like me, I don't, unlike you, that type of thing. But Andy will make a video, and then people will, they make the video themselves. So, you know, our whole purpose is to share content, mm. but he makes, with his background and all the years that he spent, for example, with Vic, and he just puts a video out and it's just refined to the T, and then someone copies it, and then however it goes, a ha- hashtag or that, that's the term. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And but I think there's, you know, way too much plagiarizing. Another t- would be the, the ghost follower. Mm. Um, you know, we're flattered in one sense that, uh, you know, we have a lot of ghost followers. They would never tell anybody that they follow our content. Right. And keep in mind, if they follow our content, um, you know, Andy here in recent recent times, it's the Steve and Andy stuff. But for a long time, it was the Steve Smith stuff. And it's not. It's just not. Um, but I do think that could be, there's so many others that could be added to this. But um We'll just go through it again to read them off. Uh, Conference Pro, Briefcase Pro, Kill You With Kindness Pro, Black Sap, Black, excuse me, Back Slapping Pro, The Car Trunk Pro, The Merchant of Flesh Pro, The Major Suck Ups Pro, The uh, Human Chocolate. <laughs> I'd like to say that was my line, but I stole that. I can't remember where I, re- where I first read that. But the Legend in Their Own Mind Pro, Soap Opera Pro, Trench Pro, Myth throwing pro, the cheerleading pump you up pro, and the last couple support pros, the political career climbing pros, total package pros. Now, for yourself, you run multiple sites. Let me ask you a question: uh, Which pro are you looking for? You're going to hire someone to join your team. They can start pretty much at the bottom, work their way up. And I know you have a nutritionist and mental performance, but I'm talking about. Not the physical physical therapist and masseuse. How are you how are you picking a young tennis teaching professional? Which one are you looking for? I think we're going with uh, number nine. <laughs> the soap opera pro. <laughs> I would think it would be uh, the number the trench pro or the support pro. Yeah, those are both great. I think uh, you know the interesting thing about all fifteen of these. Um, I think minus number nine is uh, they all have some positives to them. It does pay to suck up sometimes. As funny as that one is, number seven, major suck ups. Um, if you can't schmooze, you're going to lose, baby. <laughs> no, each each one has its positives and negatives. Um, 
I think it's awfully, awfully tough to be a total package pro where you can can really do it all. But I think when when we're talking to whether it's you know a young tennis teaching professional or someone who wants to get get in the business as a as a coach, or if we're talking to an experienced person, we we do want to you know have them buy into working towards becoming a total package pro. And uh, that means learning every side of the business, uh, working on your game if it's not a strong point. Of course, working on your teaching, diagnostic abilities, um, you know, dealing with clients and and working with juniors and adults and the whole number of different things as well as the business side. So um, that is what everyone should aspire to be. Um, you know, if they want to spend a portion of their time on the court, and that can always lead to other opportunities as far as presenting at conferences or stepping off the court more and being more of a manager. No, I think with longevity, if someone's going to be in tennis for a career, they need to respect the briefcase pro. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, sure. like a Doug Cash, I mentioned, you know, he's forgot more than I know. It's like, okay, we'll talk to this guy. Um, the business of tennis with, uh, think of a young guy that we've trained. He's going to come here and visit in a couple of weeks. Fergus O'Rourke, good German name. Actually, Fergus or work from Ireland. So um, you have to be able to work and change lanes. Okay, right now I'm working career-minded juniors. Mm -hmm. You know, now I'm working with early childhood development. It's not now, easy to do. Now yeah. I'm in a ladies' clinic. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you spend a lot of time with us, I mean, people, a kid might go home and go, Mom, Steve, Coach Steve told me to sit down and shut up. I said, no, no. I said, I, you got to get the beginning of it. All right, everybody know who Vince Lombardi is? His name's on the trophy. And Lombardi used to say, sit down and shut up. So what do you got to do? You got to sit down and shut up. So you can do a little bit of humor, but, you know, that master manipulator, the kid will paint the picture, like, this is what happened. Mm. With brain typing, people go back and listen to the podcast we had on brain typing. Once you find your brain type, we tell people you should just try to be the opposite. You know, so you, if you're an extrovert, you got to, okay, I got to be try to be introverted. Mm -hmm. If you're introverted, you got to try to be extroverted. Uh, the the P's, the easygoing ones need structure. And the people that are just over the top with structure. I guess we're going to talk to Gabe Wapner. Somebody told me they we, they like it when we mention names. There's a guy who was structured. Very structured. And in a lot of ways, I still tell you, there's a guy who, he, you know, he shows up at our tennis mm -hmm. house and he knows when the garbage goes out. We've got a group of people right now. We might have to tell them for five years. <laughs> this, is when they, this is when the garbage goes out. But uh, coming back to Fergus is that, um, like I just think in your situation where you're, you're doing all of those things, you got early childhood development, mm -hmm. you got junior players, um, you know, you've got a men's night, you know, you get so many different things and it's like, you've got to be able to, it's just, I used to say that serving and returning serves like change channels, you know, okay. This mm -hmm. is your mindset when you're serving, this mm -hmm. is your mindset mm -hmm. when you're returning. Um, but yeah, so it's, We've had some fun putting this together. It's, it's, um, I recently um, shared it and someone said, gee, you know, has it ever been published? But this is the first time we've gone a little bit more public with it. Um, I think all the listeners are dying to know, Steve, without incriminating yourself, uh, which which one of the 15 are you? Which one of the pros do I am? I you well, I number eight, maybe. Number eight at Trench, <laughs> number eight, a legend in your own mind? Yes, I'm getting... <laughs> bigger and better all the time with uh, the, um, is that before or after the toupee comes in? I get that toupee on Tuesday and then I'm going to get a gold chain. I've got to start wearing designer, designer clothes. There you go. Conference pro. I probably should be that now. Mm. I should be more just zeroed in on education. Um, I think I'm old enough now and you know, need to be, try to work more as an educator. Briefcase pro week. Um, with, uh, kill you with kindness, pro week <laughs> <laughs> back slapping pro men's night. Um, I haven't done a lot of that, but I can do that. Um, I tell a story about, I was in Germany teaching tennis for Mark Hamlin and we go to this group, go to this place and there's a guy who's got a forehand grip on the backhand and he's slicing everything and it's a group of men and Hamlin's my translator. He's Funcha, he's Sprecha Deutsch. Sprecher and Ubezette for Deutsch Sprecher. I've already made 10 mistakes just saying that. So I said, I tell you what, if I can get Wolfgang, that was his name, I can't make this stuff up. If I can get Wolfgang to hit a top spin backhand, 
we'll just play doubles. If not, you got to listen to me. We'll do drills. We'll just play doubles and drink beer. <laughs> so everybody's around. I said, Wolfgang, it's kind of like Lendl versus McEnroe. Lendl, they both had the same grip, but Lendl mm-hmm. turned his wrist down. And he mm-hmm. could really stay steady from the baseline and just lift straight up. Mm-hmm. Air socket, ATA, air the armpit. So I get the guy to put his wrist down and I said, don't change your wrist. It wasn't going to change his grip. And said, right. just lift. But I said, you can hit five in a row. Of course, the first few, they went so, they didn't make it to the net. I go, yeah. just lift, lift. So yeah, the, it's, it's an experience. Um, the car trunk pro, yeah, I, I have been the car trunk pro, but I'm well aware of Joe Public and uh, I, have, mm. I have the skill set so I don't have to stay on the court. I'm not going to go to a, a public court and run a program right? and take out cones. And sure. I'm not even going to go on the court. Yeah, I'm going to sit off to the side and, and uh, Merchant of Flesh Pro, no, no, don't like that. Don't like that. Um, yeah, I have a brother who's a general manager, and he was a general manager, three different NHL hockey teams. I used to call him a Merchant of Flesh. You're just mm-hmm. buying talent. You're not developing players. But major suck up, no, I'm not in that group. The uh, Try to stay humble, legend. Soap opera pro, no, no. Um, the, uh, no, I had definitely had coaches work for me that have bro- broken up marriages, for sure. <laughs> um, and that's why I can put this together, you know, so many years and just observing. And then people listen to me. They know I'm proud of my title that Vic Braden gave me, Observer's Observer. That's a good time to not mention names. I know people say they'd like, it, like to hear names, but let's not mention names in that category. Yeah, usually what I do is I say, I'm not going to mention anybody's name. And then I just say the name. <laughs> with, uh, you know, this happens in, in, with these, this thing right here, more more truth in tennis is tennis parents talk about tennis teaching pros and tennis teaching pros talk about parents. Mm-hmm. Um, but like this, let's put it all out on the table. The thing about myth throwing pros, I know Rob Krychek, we uh, interviewed Rob, have to come back to how he says, it. he says it better than I do, but he's got it down to four, but two levels of ignorance. They don't know and they don't know, they don't know. Mm. And people, and I think, you know, coaches are creatures of habit. And they many times, just like a parent will parent the way they did, is coaches will coach the way they were coached and still to this day, uh, come over the ball, stay down. Mm-hmm. Um, the, uh, you know, the pump you up coach, I do that quite often. You know, you can be great. You know, we, are, we are great kids, but you came here to be a great player. Mm-hmm. So I do that, but it's not rah-rah. I mean, so you can be a, a pump the up pro without being a rah-rah. Support pro, I was defined by doing that, um, is... You know, I was the gopher. That could be written down here. I was the go for it. Go for this, go for that. Um, I'm hanging out with Vic Braden and Gideon Ariel. And my job was to go get a pencil and piece of paper. Mm-hmm. My job was to go see if, uh, you know, there's any batteries. Uh, I think it's very important to have a job where you don't have a speaking part. Mm. Very, very important to have jobs where you don't have a speaking part. Mm. Uh, you think of some, you know, and I think that, you know, um, you know, a week ago, talking to Doug uh, Burdick, that uh, his father having a football background, read about Bill Belichick you know, making $75 a week um, with, um, mentioned Raleigh Grossman, one of the USTA coaches said to me, well, Raleigh worked for you for free. I said, no, 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 he worked for gold. And, you know, that, that you know, we have people actually come and pay us fees, not nominal fees, but they pay us. And that's the way it should be. Mm-hmm. Is at first you, you pay to learn, you're a student. Um, most players, most I should say, most tennis teaching programs, they have no orientation program. They just give you your ball basket and say, you're on court eight. There's zero training, mm. absolutely zero training. Um, and you know, I think this is important. Um, young guy spent three years with us. Uh, as you said, this was a very smart thing. Greg Lesur, he said, when people start to teach, uh, he's with online tennis instruction. So when people start to teach, they come off trying to play college tennis or pro tennis. So they're used to going down the line, cross court, play some tiebreakers. And then you send them to a group of, uh, you know, here's 10, 10 year olds. Yeah. Like, good luck with that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I would say to people I'm trained, being a political career climbing pro, Dennis Vanderman used to say that, be politically connected. And that's a mistake that I've made. Uh, Dennis at one point offered where I could be a master pro if, if only the PTR would be tested 
Because, you know, he was fighting tooth and nail. He was competitive using the USPT and PTR, and everybody has a different path to walk. Um, we had the same thing with the USPT. At one point, I was asked to be on the board mm. with both organizations. And looking back at that now, um, you know, time, time ticks away. And at one point, if I wanted to speak at either of those functions, I'd just make a phone call. Mm. I can tell you right now, if I asked to speak at either one of those functions, most likely I'd be put on a waiting list. And mm. so, no, I don't want anyone to think that we're just, we're having a little bit of fun with that, but um, you really should be politically correct. In this country, I don't think that you should have an opinion, a negative opinion, for sure, with a professional tennis registry or the USPTA, United States Professional Tennis Association, unless you're a member. Mm-hmm. Um, the total package pro, you know, most of them are deceased. I and mean, we go through our um, um, eight pillars. I was fort- fortunate to talk to Bill Jacobson. He's 85 years old. And he said that he'd like to pass on being on the podcast. I said, well, I'll, just, I'll call you up a few times, a few more times. And he had called me and would just take notes. And to me, you know, he's the founder of, you know, he's, he's a pioneer for uh, tennis analytics mm-hmm. uh, with the, with the computer age, but his name's not mentioned, and that that's not right. Um, but with that, uh, you know, Burwash, he, he either sent us a nice uh, nice note, and he hasn't really had his health for ten years. But with um, I, I could be wrong, wrong, wrong. But uh, you know, who are taking the place in the in our country in the U.S. Who's taking the place of Andamir? Mm-hmm. I was with Doug Cash one time at a, a PTR function, and he calls over three guys that are pretty well known in the tennis, te- tennis, tennis teaching industry. He said, "You guys don't train tennis teachers," and we're doing it through a different platform. But that's something that I need to circle back, and mm. hopefully, I can uh, hang in there for a few more years. We need to circle back and do a better job training tennis teachers. Uh, but I think our strength of ours is coming back to one of these: is the trench pros. We spent so many time, so many years in the trenches. When you house kids and you're with kids 24 seven, you can have a kid with you for two weeks and you know that kid better than someone who's been coaching him just private lessons for two years mm-hmm. with, you know, and I, I get myself in trouble with tennis parents who go, well, how many kids do you have? They go, so two, how old is the oldest one? 10. Well, you got one year, you got 10 years experience with one kid. How old is the second kid? Seven. Okay. So you get seven years experience with 10 kids, but I've been in the kid business since I was a kid and I think it's very important to tell people, let me tell you, I'm not giving you advice. I'm just sharing you, I'm just sharing experiences. Mm-hmm. You know, like you know, on parenting, uh, the do's and don'ts. Um, I've learned so much from parents on what to do and then from parents on not what to do. But, but anyway, these 15, uh, we'll, we'll put this up on Facebook and uh, hopefully uh, got a couple of laughs out of it. But, you know, one of the definitions of... Uh, Humor is, uh, how's it go, uh, tragedy with time. Mm-hmm. And we laugh at some of these things, but some of these things, are, they're not laughable. And if you're a tennis director and you have to wear so many different hats and you're not putting your, your staff through a, a, the role where they have to be a support pro and you don't even know it, you're the briefcase pro and you're in the air conditioning and you're in there counting, you know, not just counting money, obviously you're a tennis director, you have to do so many things, <laughs> but you have no idea you know, somebody's just getting by on people skills and they're out there. To me, it's actually criminal. Mm. You know, I watched the other day of uh, three courts of little kids being taught and, you know, high energy, the coaches, but no learning was taking place. You know, and that's not fair because it was just, okay, I was there. And right. did I watch the whole 90 minute program? So not fair. I wasn't right. there in the beginning, wasn't there at the end, but just a quick glance, uh, glance is you should just say ready play. Then if you have, if there's a feedback system, you should be able to call a kid over and say, hey kid, show me the ready position. Mm-hmm. Kid, show me how you set your racket up for the overhead. And I'm telling you, they can be six years old. Mm. You know, the Einstein thought where if you know your subject, you can explain it to a six-year-old. Mm-hmm. Hey, your swing should go like a Ferris wheel and rotate, the ball rotates like a bicycle tire. It doesn't go like a merry-go-round. But anyway, we're over and out. Podcast number 69. All right, guys. Thanks for listening. All right, Flanagan. Good man. Thanks, everybody.